His name is holy. And it's more than just an identifier. The name, the name in Hebrew means is, is Shem, Hashem, which means the name. And it is the character. It's more than just an identifier. It's a character of the representative who, of who the person is. When somebody mentions your name to somebody else, they don't just think about what you look like. They think about the person that you are. Amen. So God's name is his character. And when he tells you don't take his name in vain, don't make him void in your life. Don't say you follow God and act another way. Because you're, then you're taking his character in vain. So, enough preaching. I was going to build me some soap boxes and get on them and off, but I didn't have time. Everybody got uh, notepads? Did you guys get one? You came in late. See? Cause we're going to play a game. An example. Right? New door. What I want everybody to do is, real quick, spend a lot of time on this. Is, is everybody like scrambled words? Is rearrange all these letters on your little pad and use every letter just once and make it just say one word. Make it, what? make it one word. You can rearrange all these letters to make it one word. But use every letter once and I'll give you a hint. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Okay? Everybody's just staring. Did anybody figure it out? He's waiting on me to give you the answer. Huh? All I'm going to do is rearrange the letters to say one word. It can be done. Nobody's even trying. Let me give you, let me give you the answer. Huh? I'll give you another hint. The word wonder it has one O. So you can't use wonder. It doesn't matter what letter it starts with. I'm going somewhere with this. Okay? Are you ready for the answer? No? Everybody's still trying? Everybody's staring like you just saw. Yeah. It can be done. That can say one word. Doom, 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 doom. Battery just died or not. Okay. Here we go. I'll show you the answer. Ready? <laughs> now, the thing about this is, is I told you exactly what I wanted you to do. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> Four times I said it. Make it say one word. Right? I did. I was very specific. <laughs> and our human minds outthought it. <laughs> that's, that's, I got to borrow this. God told us exactly what he wanted us to do right here. And our human minds misunderstand it and make it hard. God's instructions are simple. But we make them hard. We try to read into it exactly like that. Amen. And on one of these days, he's going to go, I told you exactly what I wanted you to do, and you didn't listen. Amen. Try to make it hard. <laughs> so, can somebody find in their Bible Psalm 119, verse 89? Doesn't matter what version it is either. I'm going to show it on here if you don't, but I'm going to prove a point. Psalm 119, 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Which means, God's word is forever. It was settled in heaven and it stands forever. God says, I am the same yesterday, today, forever. I do not change. Right? Did anybody find it? What does it say right before this? Not the verse before that, but right before this verse. What does it say in yours, Geneva? Lamed. Lamed. Everybody see that? 
It's in every Bible. You know what that is? That is a Hebrew letter. It is, matter of fact, the 12th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The number 12 means government, perfection. There are 12 tribes, there are 12 gates, right? There are 12 loaves of shoe bread in the temple. So it's, it's an important letter. This is what the Lamed looks like in Paleo Hebrew. It's a shepherd's staff. It, what the shepherd uses to lead or guide the sheep, to keep them from falling off the cliffs, to hook them around the neck when they get out of line, to punish them, to scorn them. That's what it looks like. That's the Lamed. It's the 12th letter. Now, you've been understanding when God is the Aleph Tav and everything in between. The Aleph Tav is the beginning and the end. So any combination of these Hebrew letters, he is. So put the first letter with that, the Aleph, which means the strength, and the shepherd's staff, he is the strong leader. Yeah. Right? This, this is the strong, the strong leader, strong one of authority. I don't know if the battery's going bad or not. But anyway, yeah. It's uh, that word, Aleph Lamed, is the word El. It is the root word for the strong one of authority or Elohim. You've heard of El Shaddai. El is the mighty one. The high El, owner of the sky and the land from Genesis. The El is my strength and power. Rescue me, for you are my Elohim. This is all from the Bible, and this shows you that God pointed to this particular verse and said my word stands forever and my word will lead you and guide you and protect you and correct you. That's not an accident that it happens like that. Nothing God does is an accident. So anyway, I know I'm hitting it pretty hard right now. Uh, Acts 17, I want to start with this. We're going to talk about Peter's vision tonight, but I need to lay the groundwork first. So we know God's word is settled in heaven and is forever, and his word leads us and guides us. This is Acts 17, verse 10 through 12. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness. And they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were true. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women and men as well. So what is this saying? Paul and Silas went in to teach in synagogues. And the Bereans knew that they had to go and search the scriptures to figure out if what Paul and Silas was saying was true. If they could back it up in scripture, they believed it. They became believers because everything Paul and Silas said was backed up with Scripture. Amen. Right? It tells us that when we teach this stuff, if we cannot back it up in Scripture, we're not supposed to say it. There's nothing. Now, another part is Paul talking to Timothy. All Scripture is good, given by inspiration of God, and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Right? So Tim, Timothy is being told by Paul, hey, all scripture is to be used for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, right? So he's telling Timothy, make sure everything you say is backed up with scripture. It's very simple. Now the thing you want to think about is what scripture was he talking about? Because he wasn't telling Timothy to go read the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Mark because it wasn't written yet. The book of Timothy, what, it was being written. The book of Acts wasn't written yet. So they bounced everything off of what we call the Old Testament or the Torah, the Tanakh, the Torah, the, the prophets and the writings. The Jews in Berea wouldn't have been interested in reading anything in the New Testament. So the Jews were bouncing everything off of their scriptures and everything was true that's why God says my word lasts forever if you can't bounce it off all scripture it's not true I want to lay that down because 
they became believers. Those Jews became believers because what Paul showed them was already written. And it was already settled in heaven. Okay? So, now we're going to go to Acts 10. We're going to talk about Peter's vision. Does everybody know about this? Heard about it? Hopefully you might get something out of it. Even if you do know where I'm going with this, maybe I might jar something in your memory. Or maybe you can teach me something. That's what we're supposed to do. Peter's vision looks like this. Not exactly like that. Because that's like a Ken doll and a bunch of stuffed animals in a sheet. But Peter has a vision on the roof. So we're going to read it. I have it up here too. We'll read it together. Because this is a very misunderstood passage. People misunderstand this a lot. And then they go someplace completely wrong with it. Just like the example I gave you with the new door, new door one word thing. So, the next day, as they went on their journey and they drew near to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. About the sixth hour, then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners, descending to him and let down to earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came, saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again, saying, a second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. This was done three times, and the object was taken back up into heaven. Most people read that just for face value and then they misunderstand that he's talking about food and we're going to go someplace else with this. But first I want to talk about what is clean and unclean. We'll get back to the story in a minute. But the definition of clean and unclean animals are given in Leviticus 11. There's 47 verses in Leviticus 11 that describe, no we're not going to read all of that so don't worry. But you can read it at home. Uh, not all clean and unclean started in Leviticus, though. That's not the first place that they're mentioned in the Bible, is in Leviticus. Recognition of clean and unclean animals predated the flood. From Adam to Abraham, they all understood this distinction. So in Genesis 7, this is how many animals were on the ark? How many of, of each animal? Two and seven. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take thee by seven. Of every male and his female. And of every unclean beast by two. The male and his female. It's weird how this argument's going on today, and it didn't say anything about take a male and a male of the same. Yeah, never mind. I don't want to get off on that. <laughs> but there are seven of every clean animals, two of every unclean. And then after the flood ends, and they get off the boat, Genesis 8, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings to the altar. This is why God told him to take seven. Because he had to have food and he had to have sacrifice material. So the sacrifices and the clean and unclean thing were known before Moses. If Noah would have eaten an unclean animal, that species wouldn't exist today because there was only two of them. So when you see the movie Noah and Tubal Cain climbs on the boat and eats some of the animals, that's not Bible. So Leviticus 11, like I said, is the chapter that defines all this stuff. And everybody would have known this at the time of Christ and before. But I want to read the last two verses of that chapter. For I am the Lord that brings you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy as I am holy. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl, and of every living creature that moves in the waters, and of every creature that creeps on the earth. 
to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the beasts that may be eaten and the ones that may not be eaten. And what I want to focus on right now is this part. Be holy as I am holy. The word holy in Hebrew is kadosh, which means to be set apart, different from the world. That's how he recognizes you, as if you are different than the rest of the world. You don't have to be unclean, but even common is like looking like the rest of the world. And he comes for a peculiar people that's set apart. So, he's relating this clean and unclean thing to being holy. And that shows up somewhere else in the New Testament. We'll get to that in a minute. So, question, if God didn't want Peter to eat the unclean animals in the sheet, why did he tell him to do it? It's a legitimate question. If he didn't mean that, then why did he say that? With that in mind, why did God tell Abraham to kill Isaac? Did he really want him to kill Isaac, or was he trying to teach him another lesson? So, we have to, these are questions that really don't need answers. But Now, we're going to go back to Acts after Peter denied to do this. Pick up there. Now while Peter doubted within himself what the vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made an inquiry at Simon's house and stood there before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, who was also surnamed as Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about his vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So right there, Peter's sitting there doubting what he's seen. And the angel says, don't doubt it. Do what I told you. In the same passage. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am whom you seek. For what reason did you come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear his words from you. Then he invited them in and they lodged. On the next day, Peter went away and some brethren from Joppa accompanied them. Accompanied them. So we're starting to see the vision play out. He saw this thing three times. Now there's three men coming to him. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting on them and he had called together all relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down on his feet and worshipped. But Peter lifting him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. As he talked with him, he went and found many who, wanted, who had to come together. Then he had said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep the company or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man uncommon or unclean. So Peter's interpretation of this vision came to him between the time that he got it and the time that he got to Cornelius' house. God has shown me that I should not call any man unclean, common, or unclean impure. That's what his vision was. He was using the animals as a representation, but it goes deeper than that. Food is never mentioned as part of his interpretation. Peter mentioned he has never eaten anything common or unclean even 20 years after the death of Jesus. I put, that's his Hebrew name, Yeshua, which means salvation. So even after Jesus dies, he, hadn't, he wasn't eating any of these unclean animals. It goes on into the next chapter. Got to remember, the, has anybody ever seen like the Dead Sea Scrolls? They don't have chapters and verses. That didn't come until the 15th century. So this all was one writing and it goes into chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And when Peter came to them in Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them? Now this is a very soft way of those of the circumcision contended with him. 
They were angry. What are you doing taking our gospel to unclean people? That's exactly what they were. And they were mad at you. You went in there and you talked with those people? I can't believe it. Right? And then Peter defends himself. But Peter explained to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance, and I saw a vision and an object descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by the corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, pick, or kill, and eat. But I said, No, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again, saying, What God has cleansed you must not call common or unclean. Now this was done three times and was drawn up into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before me at the house where I was, having seen being sent by from Caesarea. So Peter's explaining to them what's going on. <clears throat> then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, the six brethren that accompanied me and we went and entered the man's house. As he told us how he had seen an angel standing before him who said, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you the words in which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as upon us in the beginning. So Peter's telling his brothers, Don't be mad at me. God sent me. You know, don't be mad because I went and talked to these unclean people because they're not unclean. I remembered the word of the Lord when he said, John indeed baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave the same gift he gave us when we believed on the Lord, who was I that I could withstand God? Then they heard the things and they became silent. And they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. All of that is part of Peter's vision. Because Jesus didn't just die for the Jews. He died for everybody. Right? And there was still contention because the Jews didn't know that. They didn't see it. Even though they were told specifically what to do. They let their minds get in the way. So, Peter never stated that he ate the unclean animals in his vision. In fact, he defended himself to his brothers and reinforced his beliefs when he refused to defile himself by eating unclean animals. What that means is Peter said, Hey dudes, I, I didn't do it. I didn't eat. They were blaming him for going and eating with unclean people and blaming him for eating unclean animals. He's like, I didn't do it. Matter of fact, he told the creator of the universe, No three times. I will not do as you ask me and defile myself because he knew it to be against God's commandments. Just like Abraham knew that God didn't want him to kill Isaac. And that's why he said, we will go up here and we will come back. Right? He knew God wasn't going to allow him to kill Isaac. Peter knew that this dream wasn't about eating animals at all. But he didn't know what it was about. That's why he doubted it. That's why it had to happen three times going over and over and over it. All this was after the resurrection, which means Jesus didn't die to change the Jews' dietary laws. He died to purify the people who were lost. Something to think about. So from the time of Adam all the way up to this moment, thousands of years the children of Israel understood very strict dietary laws from Leviticus 11. If Peter was given a new set of rules to teach to the people, why didn't he mention it to them when he had a chance? Right? It would have been important. This is, you know, several thousand years of history. If it was about animals, then it would have been huge news. It would have been huge news to the Jews to hear that unclean animals were now considered food. The vision was about bringing the Gospels to the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles, it means from the nations. Now I'm not going to get too much into this right here, but i got to talk about it 
because we've got to understand why the Jews thought everybody else was unclean, especially the Gentiles that they were talking to. This is a map of Israel during when there were two splits of Israel right here. Now, God brought them out of Egypt into the land. We all know that, right? They weren't happy with this. They wanted a king. So the people demanded a king. So God let them have Saul. But that wasn't who God wanted as their king. David was anointed. And David was the one God chose to be their ruler. Right? So, but he let the people, I'm going to give you what you think you want, and you're going to hate it. And eventually, I'll put my person in there that I want. Right? So God anointed David. Once David took over, Israel was the superpower over the planet. They were all 12 tribes, all together, one kingdom, one nation, under God, indivisible. That's where that comes from. That was the first visual representation of the kingdom of God on earth. You had an anointed king of God, and you had all Israelites together. One nation under God. Solomon is born. He inherits this kingdom. And then everything is great. And that's why the Song of Solomon is taught the way it is. Because it's not just about a man and a woman. It's about God's relationship with his bride. His bride is all 12 tribes together. Right? And so when Solomon takes over, this is, this is the perfect kingdom of God on earth. That's my king. That's the son of my king. All 12 of my children are, are one nation. They ruled the planet. Nobody could come against them. Matter of fact, David, it's proven that the Israelites were here in America. They were mining copper from Lake Superior around 1000 BC. And there's proof of this. The, and it says in the Bible that David amassed so much material that it couldn't be measured. And there is no, none of this raw material over there, so they had to get it from somewhere. So he was employing the Phoenicians and the tribes of Dan and everybody else that had ships that could cross the Atlantic. So Lake Superior has an ancient mine that, that they've carbon dated the materials and stuff taken from there and matched it over with stuff in the temple that dates to about 1000 BC, which is when David ruled. So they ruled the planet. The problem is, is Solomon thought with all his wisdom, he could expand on it. And then he started bringing in these wives who brought in their pagan practices. And then they actually started going downhill. Once, if you get one country united under God, that country will flourish. Amen. America was at one point united under God. Right? We're back-to-back -back World War ch champions. Right? Because we prayed. And right now we're, we're crumbling fast because we've turned our back on God and we've turned our focus on ourselves. And uh, once the Solomon had taken over and let these people come in and bring their pagan, other worshiping gods, God got angry with them. And he told Jeroboam, you can take ten because I divorced them. They are no longer my bride. And he divorced the ten northern tribes. Judah and Benjamin kept his commandments. They, they were punished because they still acted out. Because it says Judah, their sister, is still in trouble. But they didn't worship other gods. They just started adding their own stuff to it. So God let them go into captivity for seven year, or 70 years. But he divorced the ten northern tribes. So there's a law in, in, the, in the Old Testament about divorce. God will never ever go against his word. We believe that. He will not go against his word, his commandments, his teachings, anything. He will make provisions for things, but he will never change his word. Because we say there, his word stands forever. So there's, a, there's a, a law of divorce that says if a man puts his wife out, for a divorce, she cannot remarry him. The only thing that frees 
frees them of that law is the death of the husband. So we'll get into that sometime because eventually Jesus had to die for the lost sheep and the lost sheep was known as the ten northern tribes. And they became the nation. That's where we come from. Part of the northern tribes went through around towards Italy through the Caucasus Mountains and that's where we get the word Caucasian from. Not all Israelites are Jews. Jews is just one tribe. We've got to remember that. Okay? So on one of these days, we'll, we'll get into more of that on the Lost Ten Tribes and how that fits in with us and end times and stuff like that. So why? What? <laughs> why the confusion, right? Why does people take this passage that has anything to do with that and make it something else? Can you... Will you come here a minute, Danielle? I told her I was going to use her because I want to really illustrate this. This is Danielle. <laughs> Give her a hand. Okay, you can go sit back down now. No, okay. The Jews thought they knew you guys were divorced. The ten northern tribes, God has divorced you. There is no way you can come back into the fold. Right? There's no way. Because the law says you can't. Until God dies, you can't come back in. They knew that. And even the northern tribes knew that. So that's why they considered them dogs. We can deal with pagans. We can deal with Romans. But we can't deal with our brothers whom God divorced. You guys are worse. You're lower than dogs. That's why Jesus tells the woman, I can't give the bread to dogs. Because I haven't died for you yet. See what I mean? So, the reason why I brought her up here, because modern churches, can I use your arm? Will look at this and say, she's unclean. Look at that Jezebel. You hear that kind of stuff all the time. And it shows you they don't even know what Jezebel was. Jezebel brought in pagan practices. It wasn't anything about this. But churches will look at her and say, we don't want nothing to do with her because she's covered in tattoos. And God says, you know what? How dare you call what I have cleansed unclean? I look at her and all I see is something that was washed in blood. Who are you to call my daughter unclean? That's what that's about. That's what exactly that's about. And it's not about food. So why do we take it as food? can be one of these reasons confusion rebellion ignorance disdain or misunderstood scripture hopefully it's confusion ignorance and misunderstood scripture because rebellion means you know the truth and you turn away from it anyway right. or disdain means you just don't care I'm gonna do my own thing so I want to talk about the other aspect of this which is the food part okay why do people take this passage as meaning hey I can eat whatever I want now right so bear with me don't get mad at me or throw eggs at me but you don't have to answer these questions but just think about them does God really care what we do does he what we see what we think where we go how we act what we say, what we hear. Does God really care about what music you listen to? Because it can go in here. Does God care about how we treat our bodies? Does he really care if you load your nose up with cocaine every morning? Or you dump a whole bunch of alcohol in your mouth to where you can't think and you end up beating on your wife or husband? Does he care about that? You think he would. So if he cares about all this stuff, why wouldn't he care about what we eat? just a thought so I want to show a couple of things from the Bible so we understand we know what truth is this is from John this is the words of the Messiah sanctify them through thy truth for thy word is truth right the word of God that stands forever is truth we, we agree with that from Psalms Right, thy righteousness is everlasting righteousness and your law is the truth thou art near O Lord and all thy commandments are truth so the key word there is truth right and in those three verses 
the word is equal to truth. The law was equal to truth. The commandments are equal to truth. So that means, if you understand math, the word is equal to the law. The law is equal to the commandments. The commandments are equal to the word. They're all equal to truth. Yeah. You can replace that with anything. Jesus is the word of God, right? Jesus is the law of God. Jesus is the truth of God. You see how that works? And if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. The truth is equal to the word. If Jesus is the word, if you know Jesus, Jesus will set you free. Amen. It's all equal. So all this stuff is the same thing. David says the law of God is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So that word law right there can have any one of those other things in it. The word of the Lord is perfect. Jesus is perfect. You see how that fits? That's using the Bible to define itself. So we've got to understand God's, God's commands. When I say law, I mean Torah, which means instructions for life. It's perfect. Man's laws is what screws everything up. So I want to, um, people misunderstand Paul a lot. Um, they read into it because they think Paul tells everybody that Jesus did away with all of the laws of God. And he didn't. He showed us how to live. He was the word made flesh. He was our instruction manual that came alive and showed us how to do it. And then died for us to cover us when we don't do it right. But you're supposed to try. In 2 Peter, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the longsuffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to his wisdom given unto us, hath written unto you. Also, in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, which are some things are hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do all the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, see that you know these things before. Beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, that word means lawless, from your own steadfastness. That's a lot of stuff, but what he's saying, what Peter's saying is, and this is the guy who had the vision, be careful when you read Paul's writings because you, if you don't understand or unlearned or you don't understand, you will confuse what he has to say. You will read into it and he will lead you into lawlessness. If you don't understand what he's reading, be careful because he can guide you wrong. And most churches today, they read Paul's writings and they think that circumvents what Christ did. If you take, there's a lot of churches. There's churches who take the book of James completely out, the Bible, and they'll go off of the writings of Paul, like that supersedes Christ. You should always listen to the Word of God first. And then when you do that, Paul's writings will make sense. This is what Peter's saying. Be careful because you can misunderstand him. I, will, I wrote that down there the error of the wicked and the strong's wicked means lawless. One who breaks through the restraint of law. So in Timothy, this is an example. People read this. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Now to me, at face value, that looks like we can eat whatever we want. Right? But you have to understand the law of God and understand what God defined as food and what's not. And read the rest of the verse. The passages. Don't just pick out one verse. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times shall come, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seduction, spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having the conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving, of them which believe and know the truth. Those that know the law, those that know the commandments, those that know Christ. Remember the word truth means all that? For every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused, if it is to be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. It is sanctified by the word, sanctified by the law, sanctified by the commandments, 
sanctified by the truth, sanctified by Christ. Where is it sanctified at? The word sanctified means to be set apart, right? If it's sanctified by the word, he's pulling it from Leviticus. That's where these things are set apart. So that's why I highlighted that. God created things to be received with thanksgiving that were already sanctified. Okay? I know it's confusing, but stick with me. It'll make sense. But let's just consider this at face value. Let's, let's flip the argument over and try to argue that all animals are clean to eat now. For every creature is good and nothing to be refused if it was received with thanksgiving and prayer. So that means we can eat anything if we say grace over it, right? Do I like frog legs? According to that passage, though, we should be able to eat this guy, right? As long as we pray over it. This is a poison dart frog. One of the most poisonous creatures on earth. Eating one will kill a human in less than three minutes. Mmm. <laughs> you should be able to eat that, though, as long as you receive it. With, Thank you, Lord, for this poison dart frog. I'll meet you in a couple minutes. <laughs> right? How about this? Yeah. When I was in Italy the first time, we went to a grocery store, and they, uh, they had these bowls of just little bitty tiny octopus that people would grab and eat, and they'd go and, like, watch a movie, like eating popcorn, throwing raw octopus in their mouth. Nasty, right? So some people eat this. This is a blue-ringed octopus. It's the most deadly venomous animal on the planet. If you ate one, it would bring immediate death, and its venom has no antidote. Its venom is so powerful, it can kill around 20 adult humans within minutes. Thank you, Lord, for this octopus I'm about to eat. You said it will not hurt me as long as I'm thankful and I pray over it. Right? But it fits with that passage that all creatures are good. How about this guy? Brazilian wandering spider is set a world record for human deaths caused by a sting. Dear Jesus... Thank you for this fried wandering spider I'm about to eat. Please don't let me die. Amen. Right? Obviously, we can't eat every creature. And here's one of venom of the Lent. Type A contains tile, typoxin and protense enzymes sufficient to kill 100 fully grown men or 250,000 mice. Mmm. Deep fried, Kentucky fried, type A snakes. And only at the state fair. So why don't we eat these things? Because they're obviously bad for us, right? They're poisonous. They're toxic. They are not, they are part of those lists of unclean animals. God says, do not eat these. We're, we're gonna, we'll explain this in a minute. So now I'm going to talk about everybody's favorite animal. And don't get mad at me. We're going to talk about her for a minute. Okay? Look, she's even got a little wedding ring on. <laughs> the pig. The pig is one of the unclean animals that people verify that God cleaned it so we can eat it. Okay? I'm out. The, the pig is a beautiful animal. It's designed for a reason. We'll get into that in a minute. But don't get mad at me because I'm just reading the Bible. Okay, But first I want to talk to you about stories that have to do with pigs. One of them. And that's this one. Jesus heals two naked, demon-possessed men in the tombs of Gadara. Mark and Luke focus on one of the two men who is possessed by a legion. We all know that story, but there's actually two men. And I'll prove that by going to Matthew. And when they came to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there he met two possessed men with devils coming out of the tombs with exceeding force so that no man may pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before our time? And there was a good way off from them a herd of swine. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And they went when they came out they went into the herd of swine and behold the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished into the waters 
And they that kept the, them fled, went into the city. And they told these things, what had befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him to depart from their coast. Now, it's a mouthful. And everybody knows that Jesus talks to, de- to legion and says, go to the pigs. They kill themselves. There's actually two men. But the funny thing is, is these men were so violent that nobody could pass by the caves. Right? That's what it says. And when the townspeople heard this, they come out and told them to leave. They weren't rejoicing that he, hey, he just healed these two men. They said, get out of here. Get away from us. We don't want you here. Do you know why? Does that make any sense why? Um, the city of Hippos is the most northern city of the Decapolis and the Roman cities were populated on the east bank of the Jordan River. Hippos was recently excavated and the temple of Dionysus was uncovered where the sacrifice of swine was part of the worship of Dionysus. Along with the drinking of wine to intoxication and uninhibited sex. Sounds like America. The swine was the planned vehicle for the demonic spirits to re-inhabit the human host during the subsequent pagan temple service. When the swine threw themselves into the sea, the inhabitants were furious. The mass swine suicide represented loss of money and sacrifice for the temple of these pagans. Jesus took their sacrifice to their false god in doing that. Knowing that these pigs were going to kill themselves and that's why these people were mad. Let us go into the pigs because they're going to sacrifice us to a, a, a one of their gods if we're in these pigs and then we'll get to re-inhabit them because they're sacrificing to another god and Jesus didn't allow that to happen this is a picture of a a seal that they found the Dionysus the altar of the god of wine and sexual perversion so they got the togas on and he's holding a pig over the head right there so that's what they did they were using these pigs as sacrifices to Dionysus or another god. Dionysus is actually another name for Nimrod, but Baal. So that's exactly what they did with the Maccabees too. They brought a, a, a pig in and sacrificed it on the altar of God. And the spirit of God left right after that. Swine is linked with abominations. From Isaiah, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst eating swine's flesh in the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together saith the Lord so what does Leviticus actually say about pigs let's read that and the swine though he divideth the hoof and be cloven footed yet cheweth not the cud is unclean to you of the flesh you shall not eat and of their carcass you shall not touch they are unclean to you okay that's all I want is that's where He sets this animal apart to don't eat that. Now, I'm going to go to Mercola.com. This is Dr. Mercola. This is a medical website. And look what the title is. Did Leviticus 11.7 have it right? And what this blue line says is Levitical guidelines label the pig an unclean animal and prohibit the consumption of pork. Regardless of your spiritual beliefs, there may be a good reason to carefully consider your decision to include pork as part of your diet. As despite advertising campaigns trying to paint pork as healthy alternative to beef, research suggests that it may be hazardous to your health on multiple levels. Pork consumption has a strong association with cirrhosis of the liver. In fact, it may be more strongly associated with cirrhosis than alcohol. Other studies show that the association between pork and consumption of and liver cancer as well as multiple sclerosis. The CDC, Center for Disease Control, states that more than 100 viruses come into the United States each year from China through pigs. There are some obvious concerns about this aside from not needing more viruses to fight off. Some of these are dangerous to humans. Pork fat is highly saturated fatty acid cholesterol content. Diets high in pork have been linked to population studies of higher risk of esophageal thyroid, lung, pancreatic, liver, bladder, 
colorectal, prostate cancer, as well as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So all these things are related to pigs, which is why God says, don't eat that. I didn't design that for you. I designed that to clean the planet. Um, pigs are actually brilliant vacuum cleaners. They eat anything. And if you could imagine having your little Dyson, your little thing, and you take your vacuum cleaner bag off and pour some milk in it and drink what you just vacuumed up, that's pretty much what you're doing when you eat a pig. And what is the one thing, the one meat they tell you, make sure you don't undercook? is pigs. So I want to do this real quick. I'm almost done, so you can stop being uncomfortable. Because I was like most people. I mean, bacon should have been its own food group. You know, I could have ate bacon every day, but I don't anymore. Pigs contain over a dozen parasites, such as tapeworms, flukes, and tr how do you say that, trichinia? Regardless of the recommended cooking temperature, it's still possible for some of the parasites, cysts, and eggs to be transferred to the human body after consumption. The human body will not digest pig the way it's supposed to. And what it does is the microscopic cell does not break down into usable sugars for our bodies to turn into energy, so it stores it. And it wraps a cocoon around it, and then it becomes fat. That's, that's scientific fact. The trichinae worm found in swine's flesh is microscopically small. Once ingested, it can be lodged in itself in our intestines, muscles, spinal cord, and brain. The results of this disease is trichinosis. The symptoms are commonly mistaken for typhoid, arthritis, rheumatism, gastritis, MS, meningitis, or gallbladder trouble. How many times do people maybe that eat a heavy pork diet go to the doctor and they try to figure out what's wrong with me and they can't figure it out and they point to one of these things and it's really not that and they start giving you medicine to take care of your arthritis and you're destroying your body with that it just keeps spiraling out of control unclean mammals pigs do not sweat or perspire perspiration mean, is a means that the toxins are excreted from the body because a pig does not sweat the toxins are stored in its the meat and fat tissue of pig absorbs toxins like a sponge. The meat can be 30 times more toxic than beef or venison. Cows have a complex digestive tract containing four stomachs. It takes 24 hours to digest food, causing it to be purified of toxins. In contrast, pigs take four hours to digest its foul diet, turning its toxic food into meat. That's what chewing the cud means. When God says, look for the animals that chew the cud, this is gross, gross. But what that means is not eating grass. That means they vomit it back up. A cow will eat grass, vomit it back up, chew it again and swallow it, vomit it back up. What it's doing is getting out everything and the pure minerals, vitamins, goes to its meat. And then that goes to us. God knew what he was doing. I built you a perfect machine. If you're going to eat meat, eat this. Right? I'm almost done. Quit squirming. Pig meat has two times the amount of fat as beef, and it will eat almost anything, including urine, excrement, dirt, decaying flesh, maggots, and rotten vegetables. They have even been known to eat cancerous growths off of pigs and other animals. So a pig has a four-hour digestive tract. If a pig eats a tumor, and then it goes and has a big excrement sandwich after that how much of that is in your BLT sandwich the next morning just think about it I'm not saying just say okay now most people will say that God did away with the laws because they were too hard we couldn't follow them right and that's not totally true you can follow God's laws if you try I mean, we're not going to be perfect at it, but man made a whole bunch of laws that made it impossible. The Pharisees came out with thousands and thousands and thousands of rules that separated us from the commandments of God. Jesus came and always challenged the Pharisees, he called them hypocrites. He broke their laws constantly and um, tried to bring people back into the alignment that the Father set out. 
So when Moses was given all these stuff to the Israelites before they crossed over, Deuteronomy 30 says, What I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. You can do this. You have to set yourself apart, though. You can't be common like the rest of everybody. Later on in that same chapter, he says, I, have, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, therefore choose life, that both you and your seed may live. Now what he's done here is he said, hey, all of this stuff in these instructions I just laid out has two consequences, blessings or cursings, life or death, right? So the curse of eating a pig is not going to hell. It has nothing to do with salvation. You can be saved by accepting Messiah as your personal savior, being washed in the blood, and then you're saved. But if you eat bacon every day of your life and you get high cholesterol, that's your curse. You know, if you, if you tell your child, don't touch this hot stove, and he disobeys you and touches a hot stove, he's going to get burned. You're not going to disown him. You're not going to cast him away. But now he's got a scar. Okay? So there's blessings and cursings. I want to zip through these pictures real quick to show you what the blessings are. Because God left us clues. God left us ideas. He's taken care of us. He set before us both. We have to choose which one we want. Has anybody ever heard what vegetable is good for your eyes? Carrots. Have you ever seen this? Slice open a carrot. It looks just like the human eye. Have you ever seen that before? Okay. How about the tomato? Multi-chambered vegetable. Red. Has multiple chambers just like the heart. And a tomato is excellent for your heart. How about this? This is a walnut. What do you think it's good for? Brain, Brain food. It's in a cranium. It looks like a brain. It has two hemispheres just like a brain does with folds. And that's excellent brain food. It can't be an accident. Kidney beans filter the human kidney and they actually look like a human kidney. Celery is good for bones. Have you heard that? You ever seen the x-ray of a bone next to the celery stalks? It can't be an accident. This next one is one of my favorites. Because this is just this just shows you how awesome God is. A uh, avocado. Pears the same way. But avocados are good for balancing female hormones. Helping people who have had a baby shed on one of birth weight. It actually looks like a womb. A ripe avocado, on average, some take longer, some take less, takes nine months to ripen. Right? And then you can take an avocado that's not fully ripe yet off a tree, take it in the house, and it will ripen in eight days. And eight days is from when the baby was born to when they were circumcised. I didn't make this stuff up. You can, you can search the scriptures and prove me wrong if you want to try. But, I mean, this is not an accident. Now, I'm going to go a little bit deeper with this, the uh, fertility stuff, but this is figs. Figs boost male hormones. They help with male fertility. They hang in pairs just like the things on the back of trucks that people see under the license plate. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm just saying. You cut one a fig open, it's full of little seeds. Just like those things on the back of trucks underneath the license plates. Okay, enough about that. There's children present. Oranges, citrus fruits, Things like that are help fight off breast cancer. They help promote female chemical balances in the body. And they look like the mammary glands. Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes will lower the glycemic index of your blood, lower your blood sugar, promote 
insulin, the same as your pancreas. And they look the same. This is too much to be a coincidence. Ginger root and your stomach. Uh, I, I didn't know this until earlier in the week. I was talking to somebody I work with. She had a stomach ache. She was eating ginger crackers. She said, every time I have a stomach ache and I eat ginger crackers, my stomach ache goes away. So I started looking at it and I found out that ginger root helps promote digestive enzymes in the stomach. Grapes, when you see grapes hanging, they almost hang in the shape of a heart, but they are good for blood flow. And then my new favorite is pomegranates. Pomegranates are excellent superfood. They promote, you know, uh, blood, heart rejuvenation. It's actually the pomegranate is a representation of the heart, like it's full of seeds. And the priest of the temple used to have a staff, and on the end of the staff was a pomegranate. They mentioned pomegranates all through the Bible because it's related to the heart, and that's what God's interested in is your heart. Um, so back to Psalms, I got a few, like a few more slides. The works of his hands are verity, which means truth. And judgments of all his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and righteousness and his redemption unto his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and revered is his name. And remember earlier when I told you to remember the Levitical in the chapter of the Levitical separation of clean and unclean animals, it says, Be holy as I am holy. Here again we have Peter, the one who had the vision. But it is, as he hath called you holy, so ye be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And where that's written is in Leviticus. So Peter's quoting the dietary laws in this about telling people to be holy. So the point is, is we're supposed to be honoring and fulfilling God's, God's commandments, God's laws, because they are for us to live. It's not because he's trying to punish us. He's like, I set before you life and death. You choose. Why do you think John says this? He that saith, I know him, and keeps not his commandments is a liar, <coughs> and the truth is not in him. And Jesus says this, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, like I said before, if you tell your child, don't put your hand on this hot stove, it's not because you're trying to punish him, it's because you love him. Jesus is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, because I want you to live. I love you and I want you to be healthy. I don't want you to be full of tumors and cancers and all this stuff. I want you to be healthy, so do what I told you to. doesn't matter if you know why. Just like you tell your child, don't do this. Don't play with matches because you're going to burn yourself. Not because you're trying to be mean. It's because you love them and you don't want them to hurt. That's what, that's what he's saying here. If you love me, do what I say because I love you and I want you to live a long time and be healthy. I want you to be happy. I don't want you to spend your life in the doctor's office because you chose to eat dirt. You chose to eat a Taipei snake and you got sick. And I told you not to, but you did. You know, I warned you not to because I love you. If you love me, obey me. That's what you do with your kids. You tell your kids, obey this. You know, how, how, like I, I said this last week, how well would that go over if you tell your kid, go upstairs and clean your room? You can't go out and play football. Today, you go upstairs and clean your room. They go up and they come downstairs with their football uniform on. And say, I'm going to go outside anyway, but I'm doing it for you. You're just going to have to accept it. How well would that go over? No, I'm not going to do what you told me to, Mom. I'm going to do what I want to do, but I'm doing it for you. Because I love you. You know my heart. It wouldn't go over well, would it? Okay, well, that... Geneva wants to and finish it out. But, like I said, be holy because he is holy. Take care of yourself because this is the temple of God. And he gave you ways to take care of it. Only because he loves you and he wants you to be healthy.
What an awesome teaching. For those of you who don't know, I'm G, the older proud sister. <laughs> so I think this verse out of Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 22 could not be a better way to wrap up what was said. And as we sang the song this morning, the, as we opened and we worshiped with that song, I think we'll go home with these words. And it's, my son, attend to my words and incline your ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes and keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Amen. He desires that we, we be well, that we prosper, and that we be in health. Amen. He's a good God. He made us and he knows how to. He knows what's best for us. We don't always follow it, do we? And if we don't, we pay the consequences. But thank God if we seek his face, he'll reveal it to us and keep what he's given us. That's the word of God on those papers. Study it. Keep it in front of us and know that it's going to bring it's going to bring health to us.